Jeff Grills, what an absolute honor to, <laughs> to be here with you in Eisner. You're looking like you can swim any anytime soon. You, <laughs> you look fighting fit. Uh, not too many people can claim to be the best in a sport. You've been the best in a couple of sports. But uh, let's dive straight in. Where did it start for Jeff Grills, the swimmer? Because we want to touch on the yachting okay. and surf life staying a bit later. But as a swimmer, where did it all start? For well, you? I grew up on the Swartkopf River, yeah. which is just outside. Well, it's between Newton Hague and Port Elizabeth. And there were 80 houses. Can I, can I correct you? You didn't grow up on the Swartkopf, in yeah. the Swartkopf. So right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I sort of got to that. In the yeah, I sort of got to that in the end. But um, so everybody there, it was a very big yachting community. And your parents always pooped themselves that you were going to fall in the water. Okay. So they taught you to swim at a very early age. So all the kids that grew up there were water competent. We had canoes and we could sail and we could swim and all of that. And uh, so I, I, I sort of swimming. I went to junior grey, grey school. And then won the, the school title when I was in standard three. Remember the old days standards, eh? Yeah. And... Uh, Oh, okay. Well, I think I can swim. So I won it again in four and five. And yeah, without any ambition, I just sort of never trained, you know. They went to senior school. And it, it, you can talk about a lot about luck that happens. Gray had just uh, finished a new 50-meter pool. Okay. And I was a boarder. Okay. So we were encouraged to, to, to go and train. And then there was a teacher called Brian Teal who sort of took an interest. He knew nothing about training, but he took an interest in us and he made us train. And then there was a fellow called Sandy McGillivray who was a coach and he used to come and help us. And then suddenly I started winning EP titles. And then I think I was standing in Ireland, I won my first school's title. Yeah. And once again, there was no more ambition beyond that, you yeah. know, but we would go and train and then and then in matric, I got chosen to swim for Eastern Province and went to uh, Nationals in Kimberley and came third in the 1500. And that suddenly caused a bit of consternation. Uh, sort of, look, where did I come from? You know, you're an emerging swimmer. And then Peter Elliott took an interest in me. Then the following year, I had to do my national service. So I went to the Air Force Gymnasium. And uh, it was quite interesting because there was a Japanese team coming out. They were Sweet team. Swimming team. They were declared honorary whites and they were coming out in just after nationals at the, in late February, early March. And I thought maybe I could make a team to, yeah. to compete against them. But when we got to the, and I learned a lot from this, because when we got to the Air Force, they weren't particularly interested in my swimming. I was at to do route marches and, and all of this That's basic training. The it wasn't all that big. It wasn't all that big. And anyway, so, but, I, but I got tremendously physically fit. So although I could only swim a couple of times a week, I was physically fit. Then a, an interesting thing happened. Um, Northern Transvaal had sort of cotton on us there, so they chose me to swim for Northern Transvaal. But Eastern Province had chosen me to swim for Eastern Province. And Eastern Province then said that I wasn't eligible to swim for Northern Transvaal, and they had a ruling on it. Northern Transvaal then said, that if, uh, if it, I'm forced to swim for Eastern Province, I will be AWOL. Okay, so this is the day before SA Champ starts. They're having a big meeting, and I don't know whether I'm AWOL or I can swim for EP or oh. swim for Northern Transvaal. I'm changing hotels from team so to much team. For the mental yeah, so luckily, the head of the Air Force gym was the head of the South African Athletics Union. And when he heard about it, he said, Lati Carol, swim. So the, the manager... Was this Curry Cup Nationals? Nationals, yeah. So I went and, and so I swam for Eastern Province. Okay. And then I won the 200, 450. No, I, I came... I was placed in the 200 and the 400 and won the 1500, but was chosen South African Male Swimmer of the Year because I'd accumulated enough points. Yes. And uh, so then I left and then I went back. And then I started getting offers of scholarships in... America, but you know, my dad had been through the depression and through the war, and he said, "I'm not. You're not going to America. I haven't got the money to send yeah. you. So you must go to Rhodes. Had opened a small university, small little sector yeah. of the university in PE. Okay. So I ended up going there. So I had to catch a train at Red House at seven o'clock in the morning, and then walk up the hill to the university, and then because my subjects coincided with the guys who were doing their CAs. So was it a BCom? What did you I did a BCom, yeah, BCom. And then 
and then, so we'll come back to the swimming, but then after two years, it became UPE. Yes. Okay. And they wanted me to stay at UPE. So, uh, um, so I stayed at UPE. But because every time I was at university, I spent the whole of the third term overseas swimming, I had to do my degree in four years because I couldn't yeah. take five subjects each year. So anyway, then, 63, we went to SA Champs in Pretoria. Yeah. And I won the 200, 400, 1500. Look, 220 yards, 400. But I'm only going to talk meters, okay? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's... Uh, 200, 400, and 1500, and then we're South African Swim of the Year again. So then we were chosen to go to the very last, listening to Peter Rocky talk, to the very last World Student Games that South Africa were allowed to go in Brazil. So I went over there and I got flu just before the event, so I didn't do very well. But um, we came back and then started preparing for 64 champs. But at this time, I was living in Red House and didn't have anywhere to train, so I trained in the river, almost exclusively in the river. I used to go to P.T. Elliott maybe once a week and he'd correct my stroke and do me, give me some time trials, but just swimming in the river. So I learned a massive discipline. The river is about 100 meters across yes. and 50 meters between the jetties. So I'd hang a watch down and then swim. So all my life swimming was more about my strokes, so I'd say, then so I'd know how many strokes it was going to take to swim across the river, and then I'd time myself. Then I'd swim back and say, okay, well now I'm, if I'm doing a 200, that's the time I must do. And the other thing that all my training has always been in splits. So I'd get in and say, I'm going to do 10 200s today. So I'd do two, 10 200s, say one every five minutes, yeah. but timing myself all the time. Yeah. Or sometimes I'll do five 400s or 20 100s, and sort of through the train like that. So, for instance, in 60... All by yourself? You all my own, own, yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes I'd, some of my mates would come down and swim with me, but I'd say 90% of the time I'd be on my own. And then I'd say, I need to do a long swim. So I'd swim up the river for a mile and then swim back again. So that's why I won the Red House River Mile six times, because I knew the river backwards. I knew where the currents were. Was it swam exactly there where you trained? Yeah, where I was training, yeah. Okay. So the funny thing about that was when I knew I could beat everybody that, and, and everybody would follow me, I used to take them the wrong way down the river into the wrong currents yeah. and all of that. So my teammates so my teammates would have the advantage. And Red House sounds won. sounds a lot like how the Durban Surf guys protected their surf. Yeah, uh, Durban so Surf. All the water polo, all the, the, the rope yeah. guys on the... On yeah, the yeah, but I mean... Swimming, uh, uh, life-saving champs against Durban and North Beach was, you had no chance. They, they had it so sussed. <laughs> anyway, so uh, then, so that year was the year that I won the 100, 200, 400, and 1500. It's in 63 now. In 64. 64. In Port Elizabeth. Yeah. So it was a big hero. The mayor had a cocktail party for me. Lovely. So, um, and I believe that Rake Nettling's the only person that's done that, one or 100, 200, 400, and 1500. So I, I suppose I've got a record that nobody can beat. Okay. And oh yes, and then Eastern Province won the 4x100, 4x200, and 4x100 medley. So you won just about everything. Yeah. In that year, I've got a feeling that 40% of the points won at nationals were won by Eastern Province swimmers. We were just like really? it happened. Eh? It was amazing. Johnny Reen, yeah. who I beat in the 100, then broke the South African record swimming first in the 4x100. And Neil Aldridge was the, the South African butterfly champion. Yes. Derek Kutzer came second in, in backstroke, you know, I mean breaststroke. So we, we, we had just a funny team. Man. We all went off to Rhodes. So Rhodes had this amazing team. You know. Incredible bunch of swimmers. Yeah, and, and yeah. most of them co coached by, by Peter Elliott? Yeah, most of them were coached by Peter Elliott, yeah. So, so I think that one of the intimidating things for pool swimmers is actually to do the transition into ocean, open water swimming in yeah. the ocean. Because it's yeah. quite scary when you all it of a sudden don't see a black line. And, it is. And swimming in the Swat Corps River, you never knew well, if bull sharks were swimming. The, 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 you know, funny, I've often thought about that. If I knew what I knew now, because I had a house on the Breda River, okay, and they tagged a massive bull shark swimming past my river at my house. So I never swim. I used to swim. I used to swim. They had a race there in the Breda, at the mouth of the Breda, a mile swim. I don't know if you've swum it. No, no. 
I used to swim with her, and I used to tell everybody, it didn't matter. I was always the older swimmer, so I got two bottles of wine, so it didn't matter. So I used to look for a nice, plump teenage girl, yeah. and I'd swim next to her, because yeah. I thought the bookshark yeah. book was coming at would choose her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, that was... So th 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 that thing about swimming all this time, can you imagine when I started swimming and we thought there were bull sharks in the river, I probably wouldn't have been a swimmer. Yeah, you know, anxiety. It, yeah. You know at your best when, you, when, when you're quite anxious. Yeah. And, 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 and also keeping your um, direction is another challenge. Well, the, what if, if, I don't know where, I've, somewhere in my history I had, uh, when I, when the, so, okay, so in 64 we then, Springboks went over, men went over and swam in the British Championships. Yes. We won nine out of the 11 titles. I won the 200, 400, 1500, all in British record time. How and come you guys were allowed to swim? Because uh, you swim for your club. So Red House <laughs> Swimming Club won the 200, 400, 1500, the British Champs. And, um, uh, and, and, and that, on the 200, I beat Bobby McGregor, who was a world 100 record holder at the time. Okay. And then we were kicked out of the Olympics. And that was like one of those things that's very hard to describe. 64 Olympics. Yeah. What the next eight weeks were, knowing that we weren't going to the Olympics. So and was the British champs just before the Olympics? It was eight weeks before the Olympics. Yeah. So it was part of your preparation to go to it the was, Olympics? It was. Yeah. already selected you know, for I, the Olympic team? No, yeah, everything. The Olympic team was selected and we were all ready and everybody was ready. And we went over there and uh, so suddenly having swum here, you suddenly realised, hey, you're not that bad. You know, I mean, you bring your time down enormously to go and swim over there. And, uh, and, and that was a very hurtful time. When, and then Bobby got a, you know, got a silver in the, in the Olympics. And you realized, well, if things had gone right, you know, you, you could have been there and who could have unwritten all of that. Yeah. And how did you handle that disappointment? I mean, it, was, it was immense. It was very hard to, it was very hard to describe. Um, it, was, it was very difficult to describe. But I, I sidetracked a little bit because I was telling you, you asked me the question about swimming in rough water. Yes, yes. British Times was a, a, a magazine that came out, Swimming Times, yeah. uh, you know, about swimming. And, and they said, Jeff Grills appeared in swim and won three titles, but nobody could identify his stroke. He had the ability to lift his head and look around without changing his stroke. Yeah. And without that losing speed or anything. Yeah, and that came from, from swimming, swimming in the river. In the river. You had to and yeah, direction. yeah. So I had, you know, just some second nature. I sort of looked around to see where people were, which is very unusual. Incredible. Yeah. Any, anybody in your family that swam? Yeah, my, br my brother swam, you know, my folks were all keen because they lived in the river, yeah. but my brother swam, but he had the unfortunate thing of being five years older than me and going to grey when they didn't have a pool. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was... That's that uh, thing in life, in business, in sport, what, like being at the right place at the right absolutely. time. Absolutely. You can be the world's best swimmer if you don't have a pool to train in. It's, it's be Absolutely, to absolutely. And, and a lot of yeah. people, a lot of champions always acknowledge the fact that they had somewhere in their life they had yeah. luck. Yeah, the two things to me, that was the first, having had the pool and then living on the river. Yes. Um, just being able to swim and, and the, you know, the funny thing is training in the river, all the swimming that I've done up till then, I've never been, I've enjoyed swimming in rough seas and in water and that's why life saving was a, a nice, yeah. uh, it's an easy switch we, we've known about, as you say. Yeah. The black line swimmers struggle oh, they, to get they, it. Yeah. They struggle. They, they could be really good pool swimmers, yeah. but they struggle. Yeah. And, and also the mass, you know, elbows. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I wasn't good at water polo. Okay. I didn't like those knocks. And, and, yeah. and, and, and you need that in water polo. But yeah. surf life saving, luckily, I was fast enough to be in front. Yes. I didn't get clubbed too many times, but I got clubbed by Oscar Chulipski. <laughs> yeah. 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 Clubbed, you do so get clubbed. So yeah. They sorted you out. Yeah. It's intimidating to, to, to swim in, in open water in, and then. You know, breathing to the right side when the wind's blowing. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sure yeah. It was, eh? Hey? Always wind or yeah. chop. Yeah, yeah. It's. A, I always remember the fishhook mile because I breathe to the left, and you swim across. And if the southeast is blowing, I don't know how many fishhook miles I did, but I always breathed into the chop. And uh, you know, we bilateral came after us, really. You know, the swimming, breathing on both yeah, sides. Yeah. Oh, really? So it wasn't yeah. something. You, you no, we, Peter Elliot tried to. He got us training. 
for high altitude swimming, like when SHM swim in Pretoria, he, he wanted us to swim bilateral to, to learn to use less oxygen. But an interesting thing with that too, then later, when I was winning those races in, in California, in, in San Diego, and this was 2010, 11 and 12, and I was training in Croatia off my yacht, um, I started anaerobic training, okay, so I'd do my 200s, but I'd breathe first 50 strokes, once every six strokes, then once every four strokes, then bilateral, and then, and then the hard one would be the sprint and, and, no, and do that. No, we used to call it hypoxic, three, five, seven, nine, three, so every length you breathe okay. three, and then five, and then seven, then yeah. nine, it's tough when you when you only breathe every nine stroke. It is, eh? Yeah. But you get fit but really quickly. You do get fit quickly. Yeah. And and this that nobody taught me that, you know, that's just sort of what I <laughs> what I did. It's incredible. I mean I, I can see you you absolutely light up when you talk about swimming and I think yeah. I guess when you swim at a level that you've it's in your blood. Uh, do you still swim now? Um, well, you know, I've had these medical problems yeah. the last couple of years and I feel the cold quite a lot. So okay. I, I swim in in, in, in Mauritius, uh, because it's warmer. Yeah. But um, the last race I did was 2014, was the 90th year of the River Mile, and they asked me to come back. And then I, I came, there. yeah, I swam out. I came 85th out of 440. So I, it was okay, you know, I was still swimming very, very hard. So in 2000, hmm, then I did. <laughs> Jump from life yeah. saving to so 2002, 2004, 2006. I swam in world life saving championships that was in Daytona Beach in um, Italy and then in Australia. Yes. And and I was doing very I was doing well. It's just in Australia I got a bit pissed off because the guy beat me on a wave. But um, it, 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 but all, once again just diving off my yacht in Croatia and then training in the sea. Completely Counting random. Completely yeah, random, yeah. Just, 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 yeah. And then my, my business partner in America, Jake Whitley, who uh, I said had some with Titch McLaughlin for Natal, he um, suddenly started swimming again. And in fact, right now, he's assisting the American Olympic coach. Uh, he's gone into coaching. Uh, with Tudor Lacey. I don't know if you remember Tudor Lacey. Tudor was a, a springbok with me, uh, and he's, they both in San, they're all in San Diego. So um, Jake said, well, we must come and do the uh, La Jolla Mile. It's a, a, a mile, they call it the rough water swim, in La Jolla, just San Diego. Oh, so, a sea swim, yeah. Sea swim. yeah. So I went there in 2009, and I'd cut my elbow quite badly uh, when I was trying to with a yacht and I cut it yeah. uh, on, on a rock and so I wasn't really very fit and I rocked up and there was a guy there who was world masters champion and he greeted Jake because Jake had won American 100 meters masters back track champion and he treated me like I didn't exist. <laughs> that fired you up a bit. Yeah so uh, I, I helped Jake I said you, Jake was always a swimmer so I said you don't know how to pace yourself so I swam with him for the first two thirds of the race. And I said, now's your chance to swim, and he won it, okay. Uh. And so I said, no, I'm gonna come back next year and beat this guy, because he really pissed me off. So I then started training very hard, and my mate in <laughs> Croatia, the youngster there, he got all excited, and he started swimming with me, which is a bit of a motivation, so he used to swim around this island. So he swim in the lagoon, and then out around the island in the rough sea and back again. And I beat the guy by 45 seconds. When I, in San Diego the next year. That was 2010. And then he got to know my name and he greeted me. So the next year when I came, he showed me a bit of courtesy and I beat him again. So I beat, I never, he never let him beat me so again. You, you had to earn your respect. Then. I had to earn my respect, yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful yeah. story. Yeah. Tell me the um, transition to surf life saving. Was it hard? hard? Yeah, it, 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 I think where, where the, the hard part was, as you spoke about, was actually running into the water and running out. Um, the, the swimming itself, when you got your stroke, yeah. I, the, the, I loved the waves because I thought they were a great leveler, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and being able to do a bit of a, an aerobic swimming, not having to breathe every six strokes yeah. and all of that if a wave's coming. Dark, dark, the same but, thing. but yeah, but learning all of that yeah. took me a little bit of time. Same, yeah. um, what happened is I had two really good mates that were at boarding school with me, Pip Coffin and, and, and Foster, and they were Summer Strand lifesavers and they encouraged me to go to Summer Strand. So 
when I came back from the Air Force, I started going to Summer Strand, and then in 65, I think, I got really big into life saving. And, um, and then I, I really enjoyed it. That, that I, I really enjoyed. And the funny thing is this, the San Diego Mile. There, two, there were 250 people in our start. Okay, it's a staggered start, because uh, I was swimming in my age group, of course. Yeah. And, and I went out and surveyed that there was a gap between the rocks on the right-hand side. And, and I'd swim in and out of that a few times. You felt and, the current and, you and, and so everybody would have, get into this massive barney in the, you know, the end, and I'd swim around the rocks and I'd come out first. I mean, I don't know, nobody ever noticed. I'd just, I'd come out first. It's like the Durban Surf guys going next to the pier. That's the exactly. Even run into the water, they run across the, the I couldn't pier. work out the first time I swam at SA Champ 66. Where the hell are all these guys yeah. doing? <laughs> this is a swimming race, not a not the long run. Not yeah. run. That's right. And they were going off the other side. Yeah. And, and um, the, the other thing that I enjoyed with the La Jolla Mile is, uh, is actually having to find, and that's what surf swimming taught you, yeah. to find where you were. Yeah. Okay. So I used to go out before a race, most of the guys, and then you'd have a tall building or something that was your focal point. Yes. So I used, to, for yeah, I used to go out and, and pick up these focal points for coming back. And you could see people who weren't used to it, sort of straying this way and that. And uh, so I enjoyed that, yeah. And also, uh, the, my, my, I thought I could body surf until I went to Schlango one year, or a man's and toti. Yeah. And I caught one of these, I mean, I was with the lead swimmers, but I mean, I ended like 100th because I, it took me two minutes to surface after I yeah. tried to body surf that way. Yeah. You know, and the Durban surf guys, uh, Julian Taylor and these guys yeah. would go across and then, yeah. you know, they were just you, you, you know, w when you spend time at North Beach, do you realize how lucky they were? They could go out every day and find and get a wave. You know, where we come from, you think London has got stunning surf at times, yeah. big dumpers at times, exactly. but they weren't always there. So you couldn't train for the no. surf, you trained when it came. Yeah, but then even with a wetsuit you could spend like half that's an hour. Right. I mean, that's right. It was just too cold. That's right. These guys could spend the whole day. The whole day. Yeah. 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 They, 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 yeah. Uh, but it's beautiful to watch. You know, it is. Everybody hey. at the peak of his powers and in his sport, it's always beautiful to yeah. watch. Yeah. So I still enjoy watching surf live singing. The, the yachting bit, where, where does that fit? Well, what happened is I grew up on the river. And so um, sailing, was sailing was sort of second nature. And my mates, there were a few South African champions around us. And my mates sort of were more sailing and I was more swimming. And um, I had my own yacht when I was really starting to swim. And then I sold it because it was interfering with my swimming. My father couldn't understand so you were still it. you young when, when you got your first yacht. Yeah, yeah. I was about eight or something. My, my oh. dad bought one for my brother and I. But it was a really rickety little boat you know it was but it taught you the tricks of the I taught you to, to, to how to sail and and to trim it and and we had to fix them you know then they were wooden so you had to paint them and do all that work there's a lot of so, discipline in that yeah yeah you, know, you can't just have the nice part of sailing no uh, no i think, no, the, I think it, uh, your yeah. dad was clever he taught you about life yeah you, you can have a business but with a business there comes a lot of not nice stuff that you, Th that you have to do yeah yeah so the I preparation and all that later, but how sort okay of sort of helped you yeah in, in yeah, and my brother went on and became much more adept at sailing than I, I did. And then he drifted into life saving, but after not as a competitor, as an official. So he he was very involved with Summer Strand. So then sailing sort of would come back in and out of my life, and I'd bump into a guy and say, "Don't you want to come and sail some races?" Oh, okay, and I'll go, and then I'd so sail. So it's always this competitive, you know. You don't just sail. There's a bit of no. There has to be a race. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the, the thing was, the uh, other sport I enjoyed was water polo, but I didn't have a good arm. So I played for Wits when they were undoubtedly the best club in South Africa, and there were seven Springboks on the side. But they were better than me. You know, I couldn't pretend to be, when I chatted to Oscar, he was here the other day, and I said, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. He, he, was good. he was good. He was a good water polo player. I wasn't that good. I could obviously outswim the people and all of that, yeah. but I just didn't have the extra bit. So, um, and, and, and that's sort of, it, it's, it's quite a leveler because you then have to say, so what it makes you a good sportsman or what? Yeah. Actually, not a such a good sportsman. You know. I think there's a 
there's a lot of technique. I mean, the guys get out of the water and they flick the ball, and then sometimes yeah. they get out of the water and you think, geez, they're not that big and strong, no, but they've got no, technique. Yeah. And, and you see it in cricket, you see it in a lot of other you, sports. You know, I, I, what I find fascinating, I mean, uh, when you look at, at the build of lifesavers, I mean, uh, of water polo players, and if you look at a guy like Lionel Messi, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't look like a super sportsman. Yeah. It's just he's got some ability to do certain things, whereas a, a top rugby player generally looks like no, he a... Has look like look have, he looks like but a top rugby player. the thing that we all, uh, not miss, but that we, we tend to not talk about is what happens up here, you know, yeah. confidence. Yeah. And some people get confidence through training. Yes. I think your confidence came from swimming in, you know, adverse conditions in a yeah. river, not, yeah. not ideal, and you think, geez, I can take the cold, I can take the wind. I should be killing these guys, yeah. you know. Yeah. W once it clicks up here, yeah. that confidence thing is more important than anything else. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think yeah. that's where the top sportsmen have it sewn up. Yeah, but you know, if, if I come back to the, 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 the disappointment of that time, because yeah. then in 66 we went to swim in America, in American championships. Okay, so in the 200 there, Don Schellander and John Nelson beat me, but they broke, both broke the world record. I beat Mark Spitz, it was his first... Really? You swam against Mark Spitz? It was his, but it was his first American championship. Okay. And I beat Mark Wendell, who had just won the Commonwealth Games 200 metres. Big yeah, and so I was right up there. And then they announced then that we were out of the Olympics again. And, and it, I just said, and funny enough, Don Schellander's coach, Peter, uh, uh, it wasn't Peter Dolan, he did offer me a scholarship, but Mark, Mark Spitz's coach offered me an MBA scholarship in America, and I was so pissed off with everything. Yeah. I said, I'm not yeah. going to swim. Which, you know, yeah. it's very hard to look back and say, why did you not do it? Yeah. But, I know you've yeah. but uh, let, let's move on from, from the swimming, but okay. you became uh, as successful in, in your business life as you were in your swimming and yachting and, and surf lifesaving. How did that yeah. come about? <laughs> You know, from an, from an early age, I, I didn't want to work for anybody. I wanted to have unlimited earnings. So as soon as I had a job, I, I didn't like it. You know, I knew that's what I was going to make. So I was playing water polo. I sort of got to the end of my BCom and I didn't quite know what to do. And I was playing water polo with a guy that worked for a company called NCR. And they were just going big into the computer market. Now, you got, computers in those days, that NASA had less power than this iPhone. Yeah. Okay, that's, you've got to remember. No, I can right? So you sold a computer the size of this room <laughs> <laughs> with air conditioning and underfloor channeling and it was a hell of a thing, but it was major breakthrough. Yeah. But they paid big commissions. You got 10% commission. So I went you into that. Yeah. Computers. Yeah. So I went into selling. First I had to learn how to program and then, and then to sell computers. And then I did almost too well, I suppose, in Port Elizabeth because they sent me to Johannesburg. And after three years in Joburg, I said, I miss my surfing. Because I was, okay, so growing up in Port Elizabeth, Jeffreys Bay and Cape St. Francis oh, my were my home. I mean, Peter Elliott used to go mad when I, I said, I'm training at Jeffreys Bay. You go on to the surf. That's what I'm doing. So, um, so I, I wanted to leave. And I got offered a, a job in a leasing company in Cape Town. And I went down there and worked for three years. And then three of us uh, started our own company. We left, I left, I then, the, the company ended up as Nedfin Bank. It was bought by Nedfin Bank and I ended up in Nedfin Bank. And it was very nice and all of that. Sorry, but it was so corporate. It was just too corporate for me. So I left and we started this company and it was a finance company. And it, it's very, very, high-tech financing. That's when I had a lot to do with G.G. Ferreira and those guys. They were all young. Yeah, they, they, yeah they, had a, they had a similar company to us, so we did a lot of work together because uh, we were competing against the big banks yeah. in South Africa at the time. And that was a very successful company and we made, we made a lot of money and we sold, we sold it out. And uh, then I did quite a lot of property development, which was as an aside, because I was handling the finance side of the property development. If you look at the, uh, Camps Bay, yeah. where the Bay Hotel is, that whole thing, three, yes. of, three of us did that development, for instance, one of the more prominent developments. Yeah. 
And um, so we made some good money out of that. And then my auditor came to me and said, there's a very interesting situation here. There's a company called Dawn Diamonds. It was the first company that successfully mined diving for diamonds. Okay. And it was yeah, on the West Coast, yeah. And there was a Swiss consortium that were major shareholders. They had set the whole thing up. But they had a big dispute with a South African guy who hadn't really paid the tax man what he should have paid, and the, it was a big uproar. So I got involved to do an asset strip. So that's when I first did a deal with Christo Visa, because he had been in diamonds, and I said, Christo, listen, I don't fully understand. Come and let's come in and do this. And we did it, and, and we made a lot of money by doing an asset strip. In other words, it was finding out what the fundamentals, it was a group of companies, fundamentals from each, selling off this one, selling off that one, putting it all together. And I paid the Swiss guys their money back. So they were most amazed. They said, geez, we've got more concessions up the West Coast in Namibia. Don't you want to run the diamond company? I said, I don't even know how to spell diamond. Yes. I didn't get into this because of diamonds. I got into it because of, of the, the, business side. the business side of it and the diamonds were a fundamental part of it, yeah. but they weren't all of it. Okay? There was a fishing company and a retail jeweler and all sorts of things. So they said, no, they'd like, so I started ocean diamond mining, which is also, I can write, a, I should, a lot of people said I should write a book about it because everything happened. We were raising money in London when Peter W. Boerter made his Rubicon speech. So having been in London with everybody very intrigued by my story, when I went back, and this was with Bearings Bank and Panmoy Gordon, oh, the stockbrokers, I went back to see these people. They didn't want to know. So I, they said, yeah, he's, he's, I don't know what is happening in South Africa. So I felt the full effect of what, of what the Rubicon speech did at that stage. But we managed to get enough money, but we had to limp along. We, 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 we then throttled back. So we just started getting going again. And Namibia became independent. Okay, so now we had concessions from South Africa operating in Namibia. Jeez. I spent months in Walfus Bay with Comrade Toivo Yotoivo and other people <laughs> explaining that I'm actually working for Swiss people and the company's based in Guernsey. And anyway, we, did it, we got it all going. And we pioneered. The beers were doing it on the one side and we did the other. But all I had to do so was... Well, well, you know, you aren't really in, diam in competition in diamonds because the beers controls it so much that you're quite happy they're controlling it. So we were in, in sort of opposition but not competition, if you know what I mean. And, and um, so my job was to find the right people. So I found a general manager, I found a top geologist and sort of put them together and then said thanks. Project yeah, yeah, okay, guys, you, you take it from there. And it became a, a very, it became a successful company. And, and was how so long were you involved in that? We sold out in 96. So okay. I was about 12 years. Okay. okay. Then um, I was still doing a little bit of property development on the side, but my friend Jake, I was telling you about in America, he, he was MD of rent -a kill in South Africa, a pest control company, and then they sent him over to be president of an of, of American company. Okay. And after about three years, I used to visit, go over and see him. After about three years, he said, you know, the, the, these Brits are doing it all wrong. The, they're, not, they're misreading the American market. I want to start my own company. So fortunately, with my travels, raising money for the diamond business, I'd met quite a lot of people, very wealthy people. And they all said, hey, I like you. We'll sponsor you. So I got people to sponsor Jake uh, to start the business. And then I had carried shares, you know, because of South African exchange control, I wasn't that. So Jake always gave me carried shares until I went and worked there in 2000. Then I was able to execute and, and, and get shares. So I ended up the second biggest shareholder in that company. And he saw a gap. So he built a company very well. We started with four people. We were over 1,300 people when we sold it. And he saw the gap and that food safety was a, a, a market to go into. So we, I went over to help them get into food safety. And it, uh, um, it, what food safety implied, people were coming to him and saying, oh, you know, this food safety is becoming a big thing. 
Can you imagine, McDonald's got 10,000 outlets and some guy poisons somebody in their restaurant, everybody's in trouble. So they were asking the, the, the more enlightened pest companies to get to see if they can't do some of the food safety thing. But Jake realized that it was a totally different business. It's aligned, but different. So he employed really top people. So it was a bit like ocean diamond mining. I got there, helped him employ the right people and then said, hey, we're making so much money, I can go sailing. So that's when I did a complete U-turn in my life and I just went to the Mediterranean and sailed. So for the next, I worked that at, was that competitive sailing? No, no, no. I had been competitive sailing in Antigua and uh, Cowers and other places. But that was, so then for the next 16 years, I worked out, next 15 years, I worked out, I spent 1,500 nights sleeping on yachts. Okay, so that's how it became part of my life. And uh, mostly, mostly in Croatia, we sailed all over the whole Mediterranean. And I sailed in Thailand with friends and in the Seychelles and the West Indies and that. And hardcore sailing in, in strong winds. And well, a lot, yeah, a lot of it, that happens. You know, you get strong winds and that sort of thing. But the nice part about Croatia is it's ended up like having a wet caravan. So you, you, you lived on the yacht, you just lived on the yacht and then you sailed into these little ports. I went to over 200 different sailing destinations in Croatia, from the big towns like Split yeah. to little bays, and it was unfounded. When we got there, it was just after the war, you know, they'd had this terrible war with Serbia, and they were very introverted. But if you look at it geographically, then you, you've got Hungary, Austria, Czech, Slovakia, Poland, um, and southern Germany. That's the coast for all of those people. So now, if you, if you look at it, you know, I've got a sail-making business now at the moment. We're the second biggest sail-making business in the world. And so we know these statistics. It's 3,000... Ulman um, Ullman sales. Ullman. It's so as, well, the, the biggest factory, it's actually based in California, but we're running it out of South Africa now. Because uh, the biggest factory is in South Africa. Okay. And um, uh, 3,644... Charter yachts are in Croatia. Okay, I don't know how they haven't had such a good year this year, but 36% um, of the boats that are chartered in the whole Mediterranean are chartered in Croatia. So it suddenly blossomed. Croatia suddenly blossomed, and I was sort of there at the you beginning. Were there when it at, and yeah, so I had friends always wanting to come and sail. We had people coming over all the time on the yacht. It was really good. Yeah, for, for someone who loves water and swimming, I mean, yeah. that's a dream life. Yeah. Off the yacht yeah, it was. So, so what would happen is we'd anchor the boat some, some bay and I'd dive off and do half an hour's training. Yeah. The other guys would have had a beer. That's all I missed was one beer. But yeah. I'd gotten my, my training. You could catch up later. Yeah. And I always liked, I didn't want to be competitive that I always had to go to this master's and that master's, yeah. but I liked to have something out there. So yeah. like those three, rate, like going to those world champs, for life saving was okay. I've got world champs in eighteen months' time. Now I'll give something to train to, and those swims in 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 San Diego were the same. And then we we did, went and did a very interesting swim, swim from Lanai to Maui. So How so far is that? It, it well the race is nine and a half nine point eight miles. We don't do six people swim it. So every thirty minutes they blow a thing, and you change. And you change. You yeah, the yeah. They had individual swimmers, but. Um, why that one was particularly so good, the race has been going on for 40 years, it's a very famous race, and, and I swam for the, <laughs> the University of Wisconsin Old Boys, okay, now I've never been to Wisconsin, <laughs> but Jake had a, a, a place up in Jackson Hole, and one of his mates had been to Wisconsin University, and they, for their B team, were looking for people, so we ended up swimming, me from South Africa, Jake and another guy from San Diego, the other guy from Jackson Hole, one from Vancouver and one from Wisconsin. And we swam. This is a very interesting race. Hey? We swam for, Jesus, hell, a five hours, 22 minutes and 13 seconds or something and lost by a hundredth of a second. Because uh, our guy, yeah, the first place. out of the six, because our guy was running out and, and there was a, somebody running next to him and he said, oh, why fight for the bell, you know, and he pressed and we, so he sent me a towel, which I've got upstairs from the, from the hundred second boys, you know. 
And um, yeah, f interesting, the guy in that team was Graham Johnson, okay, who swam for South Africa in the 60 Olympics. Yeah. And he, he was that picked... the last Olympics we went to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he picked who, up who I was before I picked up who he was. So he knew, he looked at our team and he said, hey, this looks like quite a good team. And that's why they, they <laughs> chased us. Yeah. But the interesting thing with that race is through all my sailing and all of that and my surfing, I read Wind Guru. I don't know if you go yeah. on to Wind Guru. If, and if you go on to Wind Guru, the default page is North Shore Maui. Okay. So about a week beforehand, I'm going on and I was checking how my mates were sailing in Croatia. But before I had, I had to see what was happening in Maui. I said, hey guys, do you know what's happening in Maui on the Saturday before our race? What? I said, you must see the storm that's coming through. Oh, beautiful swimming here. It's calm water. You can see your hand. And I said, it's not going to be like that. Now, nobody would pay any attention. Well, let me tell you, during the race, that, and, and it's a very famous race. So the Australian Olympic team was there, the American Olympic team, Dutch Olympic team. The Dutch boat sank with all their passports and everything no. on it. Another two boats got washed onto the rocks. One guy had his arms chopped off by a, a, a right. prop, no, prop. a prop of a boat. Because, the boat because I mean, you're in waves like this. Jake could only swim backstroke because he got seasick when he swam freestyle. I mean, it was a hell of a race. It was a hell of a race. And um, uh, anyway, so the, we had that race. And then two days later, they had a thing called the Amakula Mile, which I won but, uh, with all the, the swimmers there, which was quite nice. You know, because by then the storm had gone and it was back to being away. all these open water swims, and I see you love the swims from the, the Fishhook and the Musenberg. <laughs> yeah. uh, those days you swam from, from Fishhook to Musenberg. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. That was an interesting race because Eric Carlson, I don't know if you remember the Eric Carlson. He was he was like one of the most acknowledged lifesavers in in the world at the time, and he was very good in the in the sea. So it was a four and a half mile swim from yeah, Fishhook to Musenberg, and they put a guy on a board next to you yeah, to keep board, yeah. to he keep to keep shocks away. Okay, <laughs> and I met a guy afterwards, and he said, "I must come up years ago." He said, Jeff, I, I've never apologized for this. He said, I couldn't keep up with you. I had to send somebody else out to go. And, and so Eric and I swam, and we were about 100 meters apart in that whole race. And coming into Musenberg, you know, it breaks far out. Yeah, yeah. And, Long, and, slow yeah. and I saw Eric stop, and I thought, this isn't good. Because if he stops and picks out an outer break, and I'm on the inside, yeah, he and, he, and he could catch anything, you know, one of these Durban surf guys. Yeah. Anyway, he didn't get anything, so both of us swam, and it, was, it wasn't so bad. Lovely. Yeah. Have you ever tried a Roman Island swim? No. You know, the funny thing was, in our day, swimming in anything under 16 degrees was considered absolute no-no, you know. And Robin Island, you had this big mental thing that it's too cold. Mm. That is and what gets you. That the yeah, clothes. and it's too cold. And it was, it was a mental thing. Funny enough, when I was looking at your talk with Peter Rocky, we were talking then about men swimmers maturing at the age of 24. Yes. And that's when I got to 22 and I'd finished swimming in America. I had thought I only had two years left. Yeah, yeah. Is it worth yeah. continuing? Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's how we thought. Whereas now the guys are in their 30s and they do. Absolutely. If, you, if you've got the ability, you exactly. can do it. And as Lee McGregor was saying, you could actually, if you're mentally well, right, you can continue. Do it your 70s, late 70s. You know, Mark Spitz came back in, in about 40 and did some remarkable times, just to prove it. So, so um, yeah, it is sort of... Yeah. Uh, no, I'm just asking because uh, I, I don't know how, where Robben Island Swim lies in the minds of open water swimming. It's like the English Channel crossing. It is. It's also cold water and the currents. Yeah. I think Robben Island is still iconic amongst the... It is iconic and I, I'm really sorry that I haven't done it. Okay, it, it, it's funny what I say to people. People say, hey, Jeff, you were quite a good swimmer. Yeah, well, I must tell you that one day in 64, I beat Bommy Gregorio, who got a silver in the Olympics, but I never went to the Olympics, okay? That's what I have to tell people. Yeah. If I'd gone to the Olympics, I would have said, yeah, I went to the Olympics, exactly, okay? Yeah. And, it's a, it's, 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 and that's how you, I'm thinking about Robin Island. I'm giving you a long story why I never did it, because we believed it was too cold in those days. Now, I, 
asking because I did one. And, okay. And if you're an open water swimmer and you have confidence, I mean, I, I cruised across and I could swim back. Yeah. I had six weeks training in GT's Dam and three winemakers. Okay. And, and we just decided, we swam at, at uh, Bloberg on the, on the Saturday and said the conditions would be best, do it tomorrow. Yeah. And I couldn't sleep that night before because I knew I didn't do the training. And my wife said, I mean, I was 46, 47, 44, I can't remember. And my wife said, why, what's wrong? And I said, I'm nervous about it. I don't want to, you know, swim and not finish. And, and she, I still remember, she put her hand on my hip and says, you don't do give up. You'll do it. And somehow that gave a bit yep. of confidence. I just yep. hung on the guy's feet until we got to the 400 meters from the beach. And the guy said, you can go. And I could swim back. Yeah. I think it's a mental thing. It is. It, it was, was, it was a mental thing. And the, cold, the water was 12 degrees. We, we and, cold. and, and. What I find now, now we're talking about it. I've got some mates here. They come down every Christmas. They swim here, yeah. and then we go and have a breakfast at Eastead across the way here, and we talk. And I'm talking to this one guy, and he was going to do the bearing straight for the second time. Okay. Yeah, and he said his biggest problem, and he lives in Joburg, his biggest problem is he can't find a dam that goes down below cold nine. Enough yeah, do, cold do enough to pass. train in. And I'm thinking, you know, mentally, I remember Durban surf guys coming down to a champs at Camps and Bay and you know, assisting they were allowed to wear wetsuits. Oh, okay. <laughs> because yeah. swimming at under uh, uh, um, thir- 16 degrees yeah. was considered unsafe. So you think you're going to swim to Robben Island in 30, that's yeah. how we were, you know. It's in, it's in, my, our training, we went every, I can't remember, Wednesday night or whatever, for four weeks we went to Clifton and we did the first to fourth beach. And oh back, yes, fourth, yeah. The first beach and back, I can't yeah. remember. And one day, three times, I went four times before my swim, and, and three times it was 14, 13, 14, 15. The one day it was 11. I couldn't do it. Is that, The yeah. difference between 12 yeah. and 11, 11 it's, yeah. I think it's exponential. Yeah. So I, these guys that do zero degrees and one yeah. degree. Yeah. Well, I mean, Lewis Pugh Lewis. sort of broke a massive bubble with all the stuff yeah. he did. Now a lot of other guys are trying and doing yeah. it as well, but yeah. this was groundbreaking. Be- because, funny enough, in 2013, uh, a bunch of us sailed around Cape Horn. We just, something you had to do, bucket listing, you know, we've yeah. been sailing around and you were in these little fields. And one of them said, I think I'm going to swim. And I said, you know, I must do it. So I did, I know I did a hundred strokes out and a hundred strokes back just to prove that I could do it. Because mentally, I think 20 years ago, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Yeah. I would have said, you can't do it. You, you just said bucket list. Any, anything still in the bucket list, whether it's business, sailing? No, funny it? enough, business. Like? Yeah, I'm very happy with business. Um, 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 you know, amongst the things I've been like very proud of, uh, uh, financed the, the guys who started King James Advertising. You know, it's been the best advertising agency in Africa for the last five years. So in 98, I financed that. I've been involved in a little plastics business with a very good friend of mine, became the biggest of our type in the world. Um, I'm still involved in a, in a, a private equity fund in London. Um, that's quite an interesting one. It's, uh, it's run by a fellow called Andre Pinot, who grew up in Port Elizabeth. His dad was a Germany. And uh, there's three of us who are the fundamental partners. And the other one is Vincent May, who is the guy who sponsored Sio Khaleesi. Oh, yes. And Vincent grew up at Red House. Uh, and I swam a lot with Vincent. And we, he lives in New York. He's made zillions. And uh, he, he, so Vincent had a strong feeling that Gray was good and so for the last 20 years he's had a, a black student, a disadvantaged student in each year from standard six to matric and Sia was one of his first. And one uh, person can change a generation, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, to give so, them hope and to say I can also do it. Yeah. So Sia has been here a few times, he and Rachel and, and his mates coming when he's going through to PE to do his handouts yeah, and that. Yeah. In fact, he was due to come for a weekend, but now they're starting to play rugby and that, so he can't no, get I away. I've photographed him, so I know Sia quite well. Yeah, yeah, okay. I do a lot of photography. It's yeah. a of mine that's actually grown into something quite... Cool. In fact, they've done a movie on Sia that I think is going to come out soon, and a lot of the pictures were taken, taken upstairs, yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, but, but um, so, you, you know, I've kept those interests, so we will... But 
just talk about the fundamentals of the business, not the intricacies of the business. So I don't have to worry my whole day about it. That's great. And yeah. Greg Carswell said, I've got to ask you about uh, John Woods, uh, Young Plunk. Young Plunk, okay. <laughs> young Plunk was, I mean, as legendary as they get. And it's funny, <laughs> the legendary people you get. You know, Lee, we were talking about. Uh, John Skinner mentioned young, yeah, young Plunk. Young Plunk, yeah. yeah. Now, Johnny was captain of the Springbok side in 68. I mean, he was captain for a long time yeah. with the side I was in 68. And he, he had a doubles partner called Hagen Wolf. Yes. And Hagen was killed in a car accident very tragically. And uh, th th they were completely legendary in being unscared of any surf, any surf at all. And I remember, t I mean, Johnny was scared of nothing. I, I remember there was a guy, he actually ended up in a strand from East London. Oh, I can't remember his name, age catching up. And he said, um, Johnny, he said, are there any sharks out at Nahoon Reef? Because you know, it's famous yeah, for sharks. Famous for reef. Yeah, so Johnny said, yeah, no, no, I'll show you what <laughs> Paddles this guy and says, there's one. And he said, the guy said, I fell off the bloody ski. I've got such a fright. Yeah. But uh, you know, Johnny, he, he was just um, a, a, a lovely Can story. So, the, the two yeah, like guys yeah. like Bones Barrett. And yeah, the, yeah, 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 and yeah, and yeah. So we were having, um, I don't know, having a meal. Yeah. And we had Harry Lamson was our beach printer. He and I were his roommates. And Johnny was sitting there and the waiter comes and says, what would you like to eat? He says, just half a sheep and two gallons of milk for my friend. And we <laughs> talking about John. <Jordan>, yeah. <laughs> I remember Bones Barrett at one of the SA Champs. I was with Clifton for a few years. Uh, myself, Tommy and Jeremy went over. To that's Clifton. right. That's right. We yes. We strand guys that went over. And we yes. challenged Durban Surf and came second. We beat Pirates at least, but uh, we, we didn't manage to win. But... That one year, um, uh, Bones Barrett stormed into the room and said, boys, are you coming down? There's going to be a more of a fight. I said, Bones, how do you know that? He said, no, I'm going to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah he, he didn't know back, eh, Bones? No. <laughs> no, no. no but yeah. he competed until his death. I mean, I've yes. got a nice picture of him posing for me in his back okay. uh, speedo with a, with a yamika still hanging in the neck. Yeah, yeah. Doing legendary stuff. He was, yeah, he, he was sort of of the, the Johnny Woods ilk, you know. Yeah. Um, just sort of Superman type of type of guy, yeah. Jeff, I can go on for. Yeah, we could. We, we could. We need to catch up again. So, okay. Uh, uh, I'll end the cape for you, but thanks so much for what you've done for swimming yeah. and for putting South African swimming on the map <laughs> and, and kicking some Aussie butt and some British butt and some <laughs> American butt. We need to do that every now and then. No, but I, I think I must thank you for doing this because. Yes. I love it. it. It's I love the story. Stories. Yeah, they are, yeah. and and you know they've happened and. Um, the, the, the modern people aren't getting the publicity and, and also you've forgotten. It's quite nice to be remembered. I enjoy that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, just uh, Peter Rocky, I said to his son contacted me and said, you've got to do my dad, he's a bit of a freak. And I yeah. thought, oh, geez, I've never heard of this. Like, I want to do the guys that I, you know. Yeah. And I started talking to him and then read up on what he did. And I thought, geez, this is a guy that needs to be spoken about or spoken yeah. to. And then I phoned his son and I said to him, does your dad still have his Springbok blazer? He says, well, he hasn't worn it for a long time. I said, won't you put it on for me? And does he still have his Commonwealth silver medal? I said, yeah. And he choked up towards the end of the... He was sitting... When, when I switched on the Zoom and I saw this gentleman sitting in his yes. Springbok blazer, I thought, yes. Jesus, yeah. this is big. Yeah. And then at the end, his son came in, they showed the medal, and then his son sent me a message and said, you know what, my dad beamed after that. Oh, that's and fantastic, hey? Yeah, yeah. For me, that, that's but, worth it, you know? I'm going to continue to do this. Yeah, yeah. I actually contacted Speedo, and I tried to, you know, don't you want to, not fund it, but put your logo on okay. it. They not even come back not, to me. Uh, and so many times in life, I mean, that's maybe more a personal story. I've not done things because someone's not going to pay for it, and maybe I'm not going to make money out of it, or... You know what? I'm 55. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. If someone picks up on it and they like and, it. And, and, and it's something you get. You yeah. Win the lottery without a ticket. So yeah. No, a you're ticket. quite I'm right. I'm buying a ticket now. So you're quite right. Yeah. yeah. Jeff. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a super fan of what you what you are, not what you did. What you <laughs> are today. You, uh. You're humble. You 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 work hard. I can see you 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 enjoy life. You've enjoyed mm. life. You've <laughs> Yeah. So many things that I've uh, and just I've not even been to Croatia. You've lived okay. there, yeah. But what you've done for South African sport, and I mean, I spoke to the the legends of South African swimming, and they all come back and say, "You've got to speak to Jeff." Uh, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, no. and uh, long may you be healthy and. 
continue, you know, grab a swim every now and then when the water's yeah. warm. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that Robin Island crossing. <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore. It's so about, I think 10 years too much. Thank but you thank you so much. Thank you very I feel much. I'm honored that you gave no. me the time to speak. No. Thank you very much for what you're doing, Tyson.